guys, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. And I have almost no voice left, so do me a favor, just listen to parts one and two of the John Lennon episode, and I'm going to get right into part three. Okay, here we go. Part three. On October 27th, Mark went shopping in preparation for his trip while Gloria was at work. His first stop was at JNS Enterprises, where he bought his gun. Ironically, the salesman who sold him the gun was named Mr. Ono. After buying the gun, Mark went to the police station and applied for a gun permit. The application asked if he had ever been hospitalized for mental illness, and he put no, knowing that if they had known the truth, it would delay his plan. He took his gun home, and he hid it in a drawer that his wife never checked. The next day, Mark went to lunch with his mother, Diane, and told her that he was going to go to New York to clear his mind and get a fresh start in life. She asked him, You aren't going to do anything funny there in New York, are you? He replied, No, Mom, nothing at all. That night, as he was getting ready for his flight, Gloria was sleeping, but she woke up to him stroking her hair. She kept her eyes shut in case this was a dream, because he was never this sweet and gentle with her, so she didn't want it to end. So she pretended to be asleep, and he told her that he loved her. Even if sometimes the things he did made it seem like he didn't, he really did love her. And then before he left, he whispered, How can I do this to you? The next day, October 29th, Mark boarded his plane to New York with close to $5,000 that he had borrowed from Gloria's parents. Gloria noticed that before leaving, Mark returned all of his books to the library except for the one about John Lennon. He actually took this book to New York. But Mark had done so many questionable things at this point that Gloria just stopped asking questions. When Mark got to New York, he spent the first day just wandering around the city. On his second day, he visited the Dakota, and he went back there every day. Remember, the Dakota is like this fancy apartment building where John Lennon is staying. Mark started hanging out there every day and getting all buddy-buddy with the doorman. He made friends with two of the doormen in particular. One of them was named Jose. And he's actually the one who would be working at the Dakota on the day that John Lennon would be killed. So Mark would chat them up and tell them that he's a tourist from Hawaii, and he talked to them about rock and roll and politics and stuff. And he would get really irritated when nobody would give him a straight answer about whether John was home. But he was really careful to hide his frustration. He would tell himself, inappropriate response, totally inappropriate response. And he would kind of repeat that to himself as a, as a mantra to, like, avoid exploding and blowing his cover. Since Mark had left Hawaii on October 29th, he didn't call to check in with his wife, Gloria, until November 4th. He then told her that he had decided to go to Georgia to see his old friend, Dana Reeves. But that wasn't the true reason for his impromptu little trip to Georgia. See, Mark had planned ahead and looked into the firearm laws in New York, and he found out that it was illegal to bring a handgun into New York City, even though he had a permit. So he decided not to bring ammunition, thinking that if he got caught, he would be in less trouble. The problem was that you can't buy ammunition in New York without a license. So he got on a plane to Georgia, and he asked his buddy Dana to pick him up, and he crashed at his place for a couple days. They hung out and they talked and Mark kind of confided to Dana that his wife was a wonderful woman, but they had their ups and downs and Mark was actually considering moving back to Georgia if he could get out of his marriage. Mark asked Dana if he could take him to go see his old choir teacher. I think this is another thing that Holden Caulfield did, but he was really disappointed when the choir teacher wasn't excited to see Mark at all. I don't know if Mark was even a choir student. Then Mark tried to get in touch with his old girlfriend, Lynn, who he says was his high school sweetheart, and he also calls her the love of his life. Lynn agreed to meet with him, so he bought her a cheap teddy bear and some roses, and he and Dana waited in Dana's truck for over an hour, and Lynn never showed up. So Mark just threw the bear and the roses on the side of the road. Then Mark asked Dana to grab some of his guns and take him to do some target practice. Mark noted that his aim improved considerably once they were done practicing. He convinced Dana to give him a few bullets for him to take back to New York because it's a scary place and they won't sell him ammunition. Dana gave him some standard bullets, but Mark was like, no, no, I want something more powerful. So he grabbed five hollow point bullets, thinking that they would explode immediately upon entering the body, killing John Lennon instantly. 
On the plane ride back to New York, Mark noticed a magazine on a rack with John Lennon on it. He thought about the bullets in his suitcase and he smiled. This was another synchronicity. Mark went back to the Dakota day after day and each time he was told that John was probably traveling in England or Japan or Spain, Mark felt defeated. So on November 11th, he called Gloria and he told her that he was depressed and he was just going to come home. Then he started spouting off about a gun and killing someone. He was like, I was going to kill him, but your love has saved me. She, of course, didn't understand. He was like, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And she said, no, Mark, I don't know. Mark, please just come home. He whispered, Gloria, listen, I'm afraid to tell you this, but I've got to. I've got to say it now. John Lennon. I bought a gun in Honolulu, and when I went to Georgia, I got some bullets from Dana. I was going to kill him, but your love has saved me. She's like, what? Who? What? And he said, you probably don't believe me, but I was going to do it. I was going to kill John Lennon, but our paths didn't cross. And she's like, Mark, please, please come home before something bad happens. Mark came home on November 12th. Gloria was really happy to have him back, but at the same time, she's understandably concerned. Back at their house, he opened up his suitcase and he pulled out the gun and the container with the bullets. He told Gloria to hold it in her hand so she could feel it. He told her it was unloaded so she didn't have to worry. And then he ordered her to point it at the wall and pull the trigger several times. And then he told her to always be respectful of guns, saying, it's not a toy. Don't ever point it at anybody, even if it's not loaded. A couple weeks later, Mark went back to New York City. He arrived on December 6, 1980. And during his time there, he would kind of hop from hotel to hotel to YMCA to hotel. On December 7th, he checked into the Sheridan Hotel, which he knew was expensive, but he really liked to eat at the restaurant there and order from their room service. Because it made him feel important, of course. For some reason, he had thrown away his last copy of The Catcher in the Rye, so he decided that he needed to go buy another one. He went to a bookshop and he happened upon a stack of Playboy magazines with a poster above it announcing that the magazine contained an exclusive interview with John Lennon and Yoko Ono, the first in-depth interview they had given in years. He took the magazine and he went back to the Sheridan and sat down at the restaurant. He read through the interview and when he was done, he flipped to the centerfold of the magazine. So he's in the restaurant looking at naked women in this magazine now, when all of a sudden he thought about the catcher in the rye again, about this experience that Holden Caulfield had where he's in a hotel room with the prostitute who wore a green dress. And then suddenly... Mark was overcome with the desire to be alone with a woman. So he went back to his hotel room and he looked up escort companies in the phone book. He called and asked if they had any foreign women. They said, yes, and she works for tips, if you know what I mean. He said, that's good, but there's only one thing that's important. She's got to be quiet. I don't want somebody who's going to talk. If she doesn't talk, I will tip her very well. About an hour later, a woman with a European accent showed up, and she happened to be wearing a green dress. The woman appeared to be nervous. Mark assured her that he wasn't kinky or weird and that he was a clean guy. He also said, I'm not even all that interested in having sex. I just want to be in the company of a woman tonight. I'm expecting that tomorrow will be a very difficult day for me. He offered to order drinks, but she declined, saying that she wasn't a drinker. He told her, this is your night off. We'll do whatever you want. He offered to give her a massage, and then he asked her to take off her dress and get into bed with him. She did what he asked, but she asked him if they could turn on the radio. Mark started running his fingers across her skin, and he says that her muscles were tensed up for about a half hour before she started to relax. He reportedly told her, A real man doesn't have to take from a woman. He can give. Supposedly, the woman started to moan and seemed like she was starting to feel pleasure, and that's when Mark guided her hand onto his... his self, and he laid back and closed his eyes. Here's a little side note, and I actually didn't read this in this particular book. They covered this in the last podcast on the left. They did a pretty good episode on this. So supposedly, Mark had kind of a weird, a weird, uh, interesting thoughts about sex, he considered himself to be an average heterosexual man, and while he enjoyed touching women and being touched by women, he did not enjoy sexual intercourse. 
He had only had sex a handful of times, even including his wife. There was something about the warm, wet feeling of entering a vagina that made him feel uneasy. Like, actually scared that he was going to get swallowed up and disappeared. But what a way to go, right? Around 3 a.m., the woman got out of bed and put her dress back on. Mark again took note of the dress being the same color as the dress that Holden Caulfield's sex worker wore. He said to himself, Synchronicity. He gave her $190 and walked her out. He then called his wife for the first time since he left Hawaii. So it's December 8, 3 a.m. in New York time, and in Hawaii it's about 10 p.m. Gloria told Mark that she had just gone to bed and she was reading her Bible, and then she told him that he should work on his problems one by one, and perhaps he should start with getting back with Christ. He agreed, and he told her he has a little Bible on his nightstand that he's going to pick up and read. They hung up. He picked up the Bible to the New Testament book of John, and he wrote Lenin after Gospel according to John. So now it said, Gospel according to John Lenin. He then said to himself, They're coming together, history and time. He closed the Bible and set his alarm for 9 a.m. and went to sleep. The next morning, still Monday, December 8th, Mark woke up early as his mind was racing too much to let him sleep in until his alarm. Before he left his room, he rearranged his things in a weird little semicircle, including his passport, an 8-track player of Todd Rundgren music, his little Bible open to the gospel according to John Lennon. He also stood in front of the mirror and practiced pulling it out of his coat pocket and aiming it at his reflection and pulling the trigger like five times in succession, just kind of practicing. He then took out the five hollow point bullets that he had gone to Georgia for, and he loaded them into his gun. He said to his reflection, The Catcher in the Rye of My Generation, Chapter 27. He knew this would be the last time that he would be seeing this room. He had said, I practiced what it was going to look like when police officers came into the room. It was like I was going through a door, and I knew I was going to go through a door. The poet's door. William Blake's door. Jim Morrison's door. It was like I was going through a giant door, and I was. I was leaving my past. I was leaving what I was, going into a future of uncertainty. There were tremendous feelings of Holden Caulfield and the Catcher in the Rye. The paragraphs and sentences of that book were flowing through my brain and entering my blood, influencing my thoughts and my actions. My very soul was breathing between the pages of The Catcher in the Rye. Before he left, he considered leaving behind a message, but he decided against it because he still needed to get a copy of The Catcher in the Rye, and he decided that the book would be his final message. He grabbed his copy of the Double Fantasy album and headed out to the Dakota. He walked a few blocks before finding a little stationery shop that had just one final copy of The Catcher in the Rye. He bought the book along with the pen, and when he left the store, he took them out and he wrote inside the cover, This is my statement, with the word this underlined, and then he signed it, Holden Caulfield. After a moment, he added, The Catcher in the Rye. It goes without saying that Mark was really intrigued by all these synchronicities between him, him and Holden Caulfield, and he read into them way too much. Like, the book would have a line like, it was Monday and all, and pretty near Christmas, and all the stores would open. And Mark would be like, amazing, the coincidence is unreal. As he slid his new book into his coat pocket, he felt the words of J.D. Salinger mingle with his blood. He said, I remember actually feeling, thinking perhaps I would become Holden Caulfield. Not that I would become crazy, I would actually become Holden Caulfield. So Mark goes back to the Dakota and he stands there waiting around for John Lennon to come out again. And as he's standing there, he remembers the movie Rosemary's Baby, which was filmed at the Dakota. For Mark, this is another synchronicity. Rosemary's Baby was directed by Roman Polanski. As you may know, Roman Polanski's wife was Sharon Tate, and she was murdered by members of the Manson family not long after Rosemary's Baby was released. The Manson family, you may remember, believed that the Beatles were commanding them through song to murder people and to start a race war. And this, the Manson family called Helter Skelter. Actually, they called it Helter Skelter because they were stupid. 
But Mark thought that this was really significant. The Beatles, Manson, Dakota connection all were one thing. What's interesting is that as Mark is standing in front of the Dakota, pondering all these connections, who happens to walk by but Mia fucking Pharaoh, the lead actress to Rosemary's Baby. So Mark was like, oh my God, this is a sign. This was confirmation that he had to follow through with his plan. At about 10.30 a.m., Mark took out his copy of Catcher in the Rye and he started reading it again. He was so into his book that he barely noticed it when a cat pulled up and John Lennon got out and walked right past Mark and into the Dakota. The doorman was like, hey, did you see him? He just went in. And Mark was like, oh shoot, I guess I'll just have to keep waiting. He says he just knew that this wasn't the right time and when the time is right, he'll know it. After waiting around for a while, he saw an older lady come around the corner with the child. Since Mark had been hanging out outside of the Dakota for a few days now, and he had been telling everybody who would listen about how he came here all the way from Honolulu, Hawaii to meet John Lennon and get his autograph, which he said in a southern accent, by the way, so everybody thought it was fucking weird that he told people he was from Hawaii. He had been talking to a woman named Jude and her friend Jerry. He had met them a few days before, and... Jude was there and she seemed to know this older lady because she smiled really big when she saw her and they started a conversation. So Mark tried to stay close to Jude acting like she knew her and trying to kind of interject himself in the conversation. He looked at the child and smiled and then Jude finally spoke up and introduced Mark to the woman whose name was Helen Seaman. Helen was the nanny of the little boy and the little boy was Sean Lennon, the son of John and Yoko. So Mark is standing here face to face with John Lennon's little boy and his nanny. And he kneels down and shakes the little boy's hand and says, I came all the way across the ocean from Hawaii and I'm honored to meet you. Around noon, Mark met Paul Goresh, who was a photographer. Mark approached him and asked him if he was waiting for John Lennon and he said yes. He then asked him if he worked with John and Paul said, no, no. Mark said, I'm Mark. I'm from Hawaii. And then Paul said something about him having a Southern accent. So he said, well, I was originally from Georgia. So then Paul said, so where are you staying? And Mark turned around real fast and said, why do you want to know? All of a sudden, Mark was super on edge. He was nervous that people were going to figure out his plan. So he just, he just snapped and he said, why the hell would you ask me that question? So Paul was just like, forget it, dude. And he turned and walked away. After a while, though, all the other fans left and only Mark and Paul were left. So Mark ended up approaching him later and was like, listen, I'm sorry I snapped at you. I'm tired and the city is scary. Mark then noticed that the doorman happened to be switching shifts and the new doorman who was coming out to work was Jose. And Mark had met him back in October. So Mark was like, hey, Jose, it's me. I'm back. They started chatting for a while as always, Mark was very charming and educated and engaged in the conversation with Jose. Suddenly, Mark was distracted by a group of people laughing as they walked out of the Dakota. Before he got a chance to approach the group, a gray limousine pulled up to the curb and Jose stepped forward to open the door. As the group got into the limo, Mark heard a familiar voice with a British accent behind him. He turned around to see John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Mark froze. The photographer, Paul, actually nudged him and was like, hey, didn't you want an autograph? There he is. Mark quickly walked over to John and without saying a word, he held out his album of double fantasy in front of John's face. John took it and signed it, John Lennon, December 1980. He handed the album back to Mark and said, is that all you want? Mark was stiff and frozen and just said, thanks. Thanks, John. John started walking away, and Mark heard a voice in his head saying, Damn. Then he heard another voice, a child's voice. It was screaming, No, you can have him now. Put your hand in your pocket. He's yours. He's mine. You promised. You bastard. Phony bastard. You promised. Another voice whispered, He's a nice guy. He was courteous and polite. He was quite kind to you. You can go home now. You've seen him and it didn't happen. And now you can take your autographed album and you can go back home. And then the child said, 
but he wasn't real. You know he wasn't real. Paul the photographer said, looks like you scored big time. And Mark said, gosh, back in Hawaii, they'll never believe I can meet John Lennon and get his autograph. Then Mark suddenly realized that Paul was snapping pictures, and he asked if he got any of him with John. Mark said, I'll give you anything for that picture. Anything. Paul agreed to meet him the following day to give him the picture for $50. They kept waiting for a while, and Mark asked Paul if he had any idea how long it would be until they came back. Paul told him that if they didn't come back in a couple hours, they were probably recording and would be out all night. So at about 8 p.m., Paul decided that they weren't going to come back anytime soon, and he would come back the following day. Mark decided to stay and wait. Now we're at the evening of December 8, 1980. John and Yoko left the recording studio right around 10 p.m. They were seen getting out of their gray limo in front of the Dakota at about 10.30 p.m. Mark was exhausted, and he recalls how the child in him and the adult in him were at a constant battle. When he saw a limousine pull up, he knew right away that John Lennon was inside of it. The adult in him was trying to turn around and call a cab and go home, and the child was screaming at him, No! Devil help me! Give me the power to do this! I want to be somebody! Nobody ever let me be anybody! The adult started to panic, and then he disappeared. The back door of the limo opened up, and Yoko stepped out, followed by John. Mark smiled and nodded to Yoko. She just looked forward and kept walking. John followed about 20 feet behind her, and as he's walking, it's like every step he takes is faster than the last. Mark was certain that John saw him and recognized him from earlier. John kept walking. His back is now towards Mark, and the child's voice inside of Mark's head said, Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Mark aimed at John's back and pulled the trigger five times. Then, the child in Mark's mind disappeared and left him alone, holding the gun that just shot John Lennon. And Mark was frozen. John and Yoko had run inside. Jose, the doorman, was like, Do you know what you've done? Get out of here, now. Jose actually shook the gun out of Mark's hands and kicked it across the driveway, and he called out for somebody else to grab it. Mark was, like, freaking out now. He actually thought that the hollow point bullets would kill John instantly. He thought that they would enter John's body and explode, and that he and John would both then disintegrate into the pages of the catcher in the rye. So now he's looking... John's not even there, and just nothing makes sense. And Mark now starts pacing back and forth, and he takes out the catcher in the rye and starts reading it. The police came and arrested Mark, still holding his book closely and saying, please don't hurt me. They put him in the back of a police car, and a whole crowd was looking at him through the window. He was suddenly anxious that an angry Beatles fan was going to start firing bullets at him in revenge. He prayed to God to turn back time as he tried to press his body on the floor of the car to avoid snipers. He kept repeating, Please don't let anyone hurt me. I'm sorry I've caused you guys all this trouble. He heard the two policemen talking, and one said, I told you. I knew something big was going to happen tonight. This is history, man. When Mark heard that, he perked right up and said, smiling, I am the catcher in the rye. When John Lennon was shot, Four of the hollow point bullets had exploded in his chest, severing his windpipe and destroying most of his throat. He was pronounced dead on arrival at Roosevelt General Hospital. Less than two hours later, Mark David Chapman had signed his handwritten confession at the police station. It took less than an hour for a reporter to call Gloria and inform her of her husband's crime. She was able to call the detective squad and speak to Mark, but before she did that, she turned on the recording device that Mark had gotten to record her phone calls. The only real significant thing about this call is that Mark was really calm. Like, he didn't seem to be freaking out. He seemed, he was just telling her, like, to call the police to protect her from reporters, and that was it. In Mark's words, he said that this calmness in this kind of time was proof that he was a psychopath in this moment. 
Mark was taken to Bellevue Hospital to be examined for mental competence and to be held under suicide watch. He would go back and forth to Bellevue and Rikers Island before he was eventually sent to Attica. At Bellevue, he was first seen by psychiatrist Dr. Naomi Goldstein. In her handwritten notes of that interview, she wrote that he was exhausted, depressed, tearful at times, no evidence of hallucinations or delusions. However, patient is religious and feels he hears the voice of God, has heard it for years, has multiple suicide gestures, denies present suicidal thinking. She recalls that when she spoke to him, nothing remotely psychotic was seen in him. Even though he said he heard the voice of God, she said that a lot of non-psychotic people feel that they hear a voice or feel a spiritual presence. Anyway, Mark told her that he wanted to kill someone to stop his mind. He thought it would stop his life. Goldstein noted that he seemed to be possessed by symptoms of virtually every psychiatric malady in the book simultaneously, and yet he remained completely lucid. I mean, after everything was said and done, she said that the fact that he didn't show her any signs of hallucination or delusions, that really puzzles her. Mark had an insatiable need for attention and recognition, and he had grandiose visions of himself. She concluded that Mark was fit to understand the charges and cooperate in his own defense. Another doctor, Dr. Schwartz, concluded that Mark was schizophrenic after Mark told him about the world of the little people. He also said that Mark suffered from a narcissistic personality disorder that caused him to crave attention and fame. Some mental health professionals speculated that Mark actually believed himself to be John Lennon, which Mark denied. Dr. Schwartz said that Mark was confused about the issue. Mark and John both married Japanese women who were a few years older than they. Mark put John's name on his own name tag, and then he signed it in the logbook at his job right before he quit. And he was also trying to be a house husband just like John Lennon. Because of all of this, Schwartz theorizes that the murder may have been a surrogate suicide. Mark was subjected to vigorous psychological and neurological testing. The neurological tests were inconclusive, but they had pretty bizarre findings otherwise. They did the Rorschach inkblot test, and Mark, looking at these inkblot tests, described scenes of bleeding female pelvic areas which had been shot. They wrote that his results betrayed, quote, a perception of woman as seductive and dangerous, oral aggression appeared to be associated with sex, and sex appeared to be perceived as of a conflicted nature. The patient impresses as fearful of sex, but as capable of being reassured temporarily by fantasies of sexual violence. Mark spoke about his sensitivity and intelligence, which he got from his mother, and how those things made him more of a man than any other men. Another doctor, Dr. Bloom, said that this all goes down to Mark's childhood. When his father would beat his mother and she would call to him for protection, Mark felt like he had a responsibility to his mother that he was unable to fulfill. Dr. Bloom said that these scars from childhood that were perhaps exacerbated by his drug use impaired his ability to control his impulses. He also said that Mark's spur-of-the-moment obsessions with art, finances, books, and other random things were signs of obsessive and compulsive behavior, which made it impossible for him to control things once the ball got rolling. At the end of the day, the six defense experts declared Mark David Chapman to be psychotic, five made a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, the sixth of manic depressive psychosis, and thus not criminally responsible for the murder. The three prosecution experts said that his mental illness fell within a range of personality disorder short of psychosis, declaring him responsible for the killing. In the weeks following Mark's arrest, he was depressed as hell because, well, he didn't turn into Holden Caulfield and melt into the book with John Lennon. Almost two months after the murder, Mark had an epiphany. He was like, oh my god, I know why I killed John Lennon. It's because I'm supposed to promote the catcher in the rye. 
He felt it with every fiber of his being that it was his calling to get everybody in the world to read Catcher in the Rye. Again, he wouldn't shut up about that stupid book. He actually read from it at his trial. Sometime early in 1981, Mark got a visit from one of the little people, an especially loyal minister who he called Robert. Remember, the little people were appalled about Mark's plan to kill John Lennon. So Robert came back and actually offered to reconvene the little people government to try to help Mark cope with what he had done. But Mark turned down the offer, saying that he was too ashamed. Mark pleaded guilty to the murder. After that, his identity of the catcher in the rye of his generation started to crumble, and Mark's mind went really dark again. At Rikers Island, he started to strip naked and call out to the devil again, and he destroyed television sets and radios and toilet facilities, everything that was near his cell. It took eight guards to get him under control. They took him back to a cell where he continued to cry out to demons. He climbed the bars of his cage like a beast, chanting in tongues at another inmate that was nearby and trying to sick demons on him. So this other inmate that was in there with him was named Craig Crimmins, and he was in there for murdering a young violinist. He recalled that Mark's demon started speaking to him in a high-pitched, fearful voice that mimicked the young woman that Craig had killed. And that this voice started cackling, saying, You belong to our master, and your soul will roast in eternity in the flames of hell. Craig Crimmins actually got his lawyer to go to court to move him from that cell block and have him protected from Mark's demons. At one point, Mark was injected with a potent antipsychotic drug, and he suffered a violent reaction where his head, throat, and vocal apparatus were all paralyzed. After that, he promised to confine the demons going forward but the demons didn't leave for a few years. In the summer of 1981, Mark was moved to the Attica Correctional Facility. Gloria quit her job and moved to Attica, and she visited him almost every day. She's stuck by him to this day. There was another occasion where the prison staff bent Mark over a bed and pulled down his pants, and the nurse pulled out a hypodermic needle, and Mark said, Break that needle off in my ass. Break it off there. Just stick it up in there and break it off. Mark started to give himself exorcisms while he was in Attica with the help of a minister who agreed to pray outside of the prison at designated times. Mark says that he vomited seven evil spirits that evaporated into the walls of his cell. According to Mark, his demons disappeared in 1985. In 1992, Mark David Chapman did an interview with Larry King. He did it from the Attica Correctional Facility. It's a really long interview. If you want to see it, I linked it on the episode page on BrokenLimelight.com. Mark David Chapman has been eligible for parole since the year 2000, but he has been denied every time. That's 11 times so far. His 12th parole hearing is scheduled for August 2022. Gloria, to this day, has never left his side. They get conjugal visits once a year, where they spend 44 hours together in a prison trailer, having sex and making pizzas. She's confident that he's going to be free one day and able to spend the rest of his days with her. So for perspective, they were only married for 18 months. And he was horrible to her. Like, this loyalty is unreal. There's one more thing I want to add, and I actually read it in this one documentary, so I don't, I don't know how true this is. But supposedly, Mark had a list of substitute celebrities who he would kill if he couldn't get John Lennon. The next person on the list was Walter Cronkite, then Johnny Carson, George C. Scott, Jackie Kennedy Onassis, or Marlon Brando. Supposedly, these were all potential targets. Apparently, he planned to kill George C. Scott during a show. He was just going to stand up in the middle of the show and fire into him. Now, as if Mark hadn't done enough already, in 1981, another 25-year-old man was inspired by John Lennon's death to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. This man was named John Hinckley Jr., and he became obsessed with the 1976 movie Taxi, where Robert De Niro plots to assassinate the president. This guy, John Hinckley Jr., also became obsessed with Jodie Foster, who was about 18 at the time. He actually stalked her for months. When she started going to Yale University, He moved to Connecticut and started stalking her. He started calling her and leaving all these messages on her answering machine, and he was sending her letters, 
and ultimately he decided that he couldn't wait any longer to impress her. On March 30th, he shot Ronald Reagan. Reagan survived and went on to finish his term. Jodie Foster was understandably traumatized by this, but we will discuss that another time. All right, so that's the story of John Lennon and his death and inside the mind of Mark David Chapman. Before I go, I just want to read to you one little quote. This is about the Beatles. This was from Billboard.com. It says, By any measure, no one comes close to matching the success of the Beatles' primary songwriters. The dichotomy between Paul McCartney's optimism and John Lennon's realism always pushed each songwriter to best the other, resulting in an unprecedented collaboration that yielded 180 songs, the most albums sold by any artist, and a still unbroken record of 20 number ones on the Billboard Hot 100. Lennon said he wished he could write a pop song like McCartney, McCartney said he always wanted Lennon's steely, skeptical look at sacred institutions. The combination remains the best there ever was. Okay, that's everything for today. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening to this long-ass story. But man, that guy's brain was bonkers, right? I didn't know half of that. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell your friends and consider leaving me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or on BrokenLimelight.com. Remember, you can always go to BrokenLimelight.com and there you can find an almost complete transcript of this episode along with pictures, sometimes interview videos. And I have merch! Okay guys, until next time, bye! Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.